So in this next video, we're going to complete fertilization. So we'll entitle the next flowchart fertilization completion. And here what we're going to do first is sort of look at what has happened thus far and then complete the process of fertilization, both from the sea urchin perspective and the male or, and the mammal or human perspective, as we'll see. So thus far, what have we done? We're going to look at three major events that we've covered thus far in this whole scheme of fertilization in the broader context of development. So what we've done thus far is highlight the fact that sperm has to and did recognize egg. In addition, we also highlighted that the sperm had a nucleus, and the sperm nucleus is what entered the egg. When did that happen? That happened at the onset of plasmogamy. This is the plasmogamy result. In addition, after this recognition and completion of plasmogamy, we also had some changes. We had to do some changes to the egg in order to prevent polyspermy. So thus far, we've prevented polyspermy. How have we done this? Well, this has been done directly by changes at the egg coverings. So there have been direct changes at the egg coverings, specifically the cortex or the zona pellucida in which we had structural changes to prevent any more possible fertilizations. So let's continue the story. As we move forward, what's next? Now that we've prevented polyspermy, what's actually going to happen simultaneously with this prevention is a process called egg activation. This is something we highlighted when we talked about the over, overview of fertilization, and the activation steps necessary here are similar to what we've already covered. In essence, when we have egg activation, this is going to consist of a series of metabolic reactions that start and speed up, that start plus speed up, to begin embryonic development. So when we want to activate this egg, when this egg is activated, several metabolic reactions will start activation and they will speed up all in order to promote and begin embryonic DEV for development. So now we're explicitly mentioning the fact that development is going to begin once we complete and activate this egg. So how does this activation happen? What causes the activation? The activation is caused by something we actually covered. It's triggered by that increase of calcium plus ions in the cytoplasm. And how did that increase happen? Well, that was, of course, through a signal transduction pathway. That was a result or a process of the slow block to polyspermy. This is going to have another sort of side effect besides causing the cortical granules to cause the hardening of egg coverings. It's also going to, so we'll write that it forms a cortical reaction, of course. So that's going to be something that structurally changes the egg, thus it causes this embryonic development to sort of start. But calcium increase in the cytoplasm also causes a direct sort of effect on maternal enzymes. Maternal enzymes and proteins will be activated. Now, when the developing zygote needs to sort of grow, you need maternal enzymes and proteins that are part of this large egg. Remember, we always say that the large, the egg is a large non motile structure. Why is it large? Well, it contains maternal enzymes and proteins that the mom has given to this zygote essentially in order to promote the development in the very early stages. And development is promoted because of this triggering of increase of calcium also then causes, because of this enzymes and proteins being activated overall, this causes an increase in protein synthesis. And protein synthesis is going to be specifically of maternal mRNA. What is maternal mRNA? mRNA is the result of transcription, and that's going to th later be translated via protein synthesis into these maternal enzymes and proteins. Why are we doing this? This is all to help develop the embryo. Right now, it's actually a zygote. Can't really do much on its own. You need to help it. How do you help it? Utilize maternal enzymes and proteins that have been synthesized as a part of protein synthesis. What caused this utilization to even start? This increase in calcium. 
That was our first step in order to activate the egg as a whole. Okay, so we've activated the egg. What's next? Now, what's going to happen next is the explicit moment of fertilization, you could say, the explicit moment of the fusion of gametes, and that's what we'll talk about next. So now what we have to look at is the fusion of sperm plus egg, and this is going to be specifically of their nuclei. Fusion of sperm plus egg nuclei, because we've already actually fused their membranes, and now we're going to fuse their nuclei to really sort of highlight the fertilization event. Now, what we want to keep in mind is that this is happening almost simultaneously, and actually it is happening simultaneously, I should say, at the same time as the egg is activating, as the egg activation. It's a very sort of simultaneous, multifaceted process that's going to occur. So let's take a look at two different forms of egg development. What we have to keep in mind is that this idea of meiosis, it's going to be a critical part of fertilization and reproduction as a whole because this is how gametes work. Meiosis is what runs gamete, fertil gamete production. So if you look at sea urchins, which are simpler organisms, of course, they're echinodermatas. These are still animals, but what's going to be different about them versus us, let's say, is that their meiosis, both one and two, is completed of their eggs. The meiosis of their eggs is completed at the time of release. So they never occur or never have this moment of arresting meiosis at certain phases. Sea urchins have a completed meiosis the moment that they're released into the water, these eggs of sea urchins, versus humans. Humans have a little bit of a different story here, as we know from female reproduction. Humans are going to release an egg, process of ovulation, but that egg is technically also called a secondary oocyte as a result of the menstrual cycle and the ovulatory event at day 14. That secondary oocyte is going to be at metaphase 2. It's not complete. And remember how I said we'll get back to this, why it's not complete or when it will be complete? This is when we're going to complete it. Upon fertilization, once fertilization happens, once the fusion of sperm and egg happens, this causes and directly results in the finishing of meiosis. So once fertilization happens, the egg will finish meiosis, and this will then cause the following. This will cause the egg nucleus to separate from a separate polar body. There's going to be another unequal cytokinesis event that's going to occur here. That's going to result in the egg nucleus plus a new polar body. Let's remember, if we finish meiosis, this egg nucleus before as a secondary oocyte was N, of course, but what we're going to happen here is that we're going to form a haploid egg nucleus and still another haploid new polar body. What do you think is going to happen to the polar body? It just disintegrates. This is going to be the focus of this fusion event that we need, and that's how we're going to finish meiosis. So let's do this. Now, remember, we said new polar body here because we actually formed a polar body previously at the end of meiosis 1 during the menstrual cycle, and in that process, what we did was disintegrate that polar body. Same thing's going to happen here. So now that's our egg development story. So what's going to happen in terms of fusion? Let's take a look at the fusion event now. So we're going to have a sperm nucleus, haploid or diploid. The sperm nucleus, as it's released, the moment it's released, is haploid as a result of spermatogenesis. This, sper this sperm nucleus is going to be guided to the egg nucleus. So the egg nucleus now, what you have to keep in mind right now is location. Right now, we've already had plasmogamy. The sperm nucleus is pretty darn close right now to the egg nucleus. They're basically two nuclei right next to each other, but now they're going to be guided to sort of fuse together. Both nuclei will fuse together, and this is also a haploid nucleus, and this fusion event is going to be guided via microtubules. So it's guided to the egg nucleus um, via microtubules. Microtubules are essentially the highways of cells, and you can actually see this process happening in some of the videos that I've posted on the um, playlist section of the site for this lecture. Now, what's going to this? What's this going to result in? It's going to result in the fusion, the direct fusion of nuclei. When you fuse nuclei, what do you call this? It's not plasmogamy. It's now called karyogamy. Karyogamy is going to result in the fusion of a haploid plus another haploid gamete to give us a diploid structure. 
What is that diploid structure called? That is the zygote. So what we want to sort of keep in mind right now is another reflection of difference between the sea urchins and humans in terms of chronology and time. Sea urchins, this process of karyogamy happens about 20 minutes, 20 minutes, keep that number in mind for right now, 20 minutes after the sperm has entered the egg. So 20 minutes after sperm entry to egg, Look at what happens in humans. Humans, this actually takes several hours after sperm entry into egg. Several hours. So it's a much longer, more drawn out process after sperm entry into egg. So let's write that down. Sperm entry to egg. Okay, so keep that difference in mind as well in terms of time. Karyogamy takes several hours after in humans and it only takes 20 minutes in sea urchins. Furthermore, let's complete this idea of fusion by thinking and talking about the end result. We've already mentioned it. The end result, of course, is now a true zygote. A fused sperm nuclei plus egg nuclei, which then would mean a diploid structure that will give rise, so let's write this down, to every other cell within the organism. Every single cell begins its history of life as a single-celled zygote. That idea of this history of life starting as one cell can be summarized into a word. This means that the zygote is totipotent. Totipotent. It's a powerful biological term because this means exactly what I said. A totipotent cell gives rise to all gives rise to all, absolutely all, cell types of the individual, of IND for individual. Every heart cell, every liver cell, every immune cell, every brain cell is going to be a result of the development of this zygote from this point forward. So now, what we need to sort of state as far as fertilization and its completion is that the end of fertilization itself is technically not when this fusion happens. It actually has to be when you have a successful first division. That is the technical end of fertilization. The technical end of fertilization is the first zygote division. The first time the zygote successfully goes from one cell to two cells is when you have completed fertilization because that means fertilization was successful, the nuclei fused normally and successfully, and thus it will give rise to everything else successfully and normally. So now let's just look one more time at the difference between sea urchins and humans, this idea of the first zygote division. Again, let's look at time. In far, as far as the timeline is concerned, this takes about 90 minutes after sperm binds egg. So the moment we have this binding, we're going to have a 90 minute sort of hold and development of this zygote to prepare itself for its first division ever. So of that time of the 90 minutes, 20 minutes is devoted to this karyogamy event that's going to happen later. And then in humans, of course, it's going to be different. In humans, the end, the spark of fertilization, or the end, I should say, of fertilization is about, and it depends, but it's about 12 to 36 hours, 12 to 36 hours after the sperm binds egg. So just keep that in mind, the stark contrast between timelines of sea urchin and human fertilization completion. And that is the end of fertilization. Now what we have to talk about is this. We have to talk about real development. And the development that we'll talk about is known as cleavages. Those are divisions of this zygote. How do we go from one cell to a trillion cells? And that's the next topic within this lecture.